Okay, we're live. All right, cool. So if you guys have any questions, any comments at all, just shout it out. I'm probably going to say it back to you so that way people on the recording can hear it. So. Okay. So everyone got the uh, GitHub page up? Good to go. All right, cool. What we're going to do first is go ahead and open up a terminal window. And we're going to type ifconfig a. Now, this is your local uh, network connections. You'll notice the very first one at the bottom, that's the uh, loopback interface. Even if your system's like totally messed up, you'll always have a loopback. The loopback is just a uh, local host, it's just you talking to yourself. So that's always going to be there. Uh, the first one you see here is ETH0. Now, because I'm running this in VirtualBox, this is a uh, virtualized Ethernet connection. Sometimes it'll be your Wi-Fi card. Sometimes it'll be some kind of other Ethernet card. Uh, in other versions of Ubuntu and Debian, this will be called uh, W1, S1, P1. So if you see either one of those names, it basically means this is your network card. So first thing here is the local IP address. So you can see 10.0.2.1.5. And that's pretty much default if you're using uh, VirtualBox. And you can see down here the second line, that is your uh, IPv6 address. And much other details that we're not going to worry about too much about. So that's just step one to say, you know, do we have an actual network card? All right, next up is we're going to go ahead and ping Google. So ping space google.com. And we do this under Kali and Debian. This will just keep running. If you do it under Windows, it'll stop under like five commands. And as long as you can run ping, then that means you're online. Uh, if you guys need help with the Wi-Fi, it's actually over there on the uh, board. It's uh, pivotal guest passwords. Uh, keep it simple. So. Now, when you run the ping command, what this is actually doing in the background, it's sending TCP requests and ICMP requests to this IP address here. This two one six five eight. TCP requests. Uh, ICMP. Yeah. So it's sending that to uh, port eighty. And this is at uh, 216-58217174. So that's what uh, Google.com uh, converts to locally here. But you can also ping 8.8.8.8. That's also Google. So if you ever find yourself having issues with uh, network connectivity, try both. 8.8.8.8 is the DNS of Google. Exactly. Yes, it's the DNS. So if you can't ping Google.com for whatever reason, try pinging 8.8.8.8 because that'll always be online. If you can't do either of those, then there's something really, really, really wrong with your network. Well, if you think Google, and, um, if DNS is messed up, you know, that's the first thing it does, right? It looks at the resolver name. Yep. Yeah, so it'll look at the uh, resolver name if you can't, can't do it correctly. And usually this will just fail. So like sometimes my girlfriend's running uh, BitTorrent, it'll just completely flood my network, and you'll, you'll be connected to the Wi-Fi, but you won't be online. So you can kind of diagnose it this way. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do things uh, locally to try and find out what processes are running, make sure your network's connecting, explain how network services go, and then I'll kind of scope out a little bit to be more abstract and show you how DNS operates because it's better to understand the individual server first and then the networking part of it. So. Uh, next up is PS space AUX. And I run this command 100 times a day. This basically just lists out what the uh, processes are that are running in the background of your system. So this is like the task manager in Windows. It just says, this program's running. And if you scroll all the way to the very top of it, yes, the command is uh, ps space aux. So the first column is what user is running this. Uh, by default, most processes will run as root user. These are all system level services. Next up is the process ID, which you'll notice is all sequential, you know, 12345 the amount of CPU, amount of memory, uh, various other services. And then way at the end, on the far right-hand column, you'll see the actual command itself. 
So these are all just things that start the system up, you know, the BIOS, the SCSI, the audio drivers, everything like that. It's pretty boring until you get about halfway down. So here you can see where I'm running the bash terminal it is that command right there. And then I'm running the uh, Ice Weasel browser in the background. So you can see that right there. So one of the things I find is really useful when you do get into a system is you do want to run PS aux because if you just do a port scan on something, all you're doing is you're seeing what's publicly facing, what's publicly running. But sometimes the service will be running internally. So try and run PS aux if you can get command line control and just kind of see what else is there. So there's that. And to break it down a little bit too, what the command is actually doing. Uh, the A command is saying display all processes, uh, including run by other users. So in Kali Linux, you are the root user, so it'll show you everything. But if you're not, like say my, my username is Apollo, and I'm not a root user, I'm only going to see the processes run by that user. So if you run PS aux, you don't see everything, try running it as a sudo. So that's a good thing to uh, do some recon on your targets for. Uh, a, I'm going to say the U command, just says display it as human readable. It makes it a little easier to read the columns and stuff. Uh, X says display all processes, including the ones without TTY. Uh, TTY just means it doesn't have the ability to uh, communicate over uh, terminal. So when you run uh, PSAUX, it just says like show me everything from everyone. I don't care what it's running at, just show it to me. Uh, next up is IP tables dash uppercase L. And what this will show you is your local firewall rules. By default, Kali Linux doesn't really enable any firewall rules. What they did for the default um, virtual image is they turned everything off for services. So there's a ton of services there they're just not running yet. Uh, other times when you're scoping out a target, you may find that if you have command line access of any kind, not even root, just any kind of command line access, then you can run IP tables and you can see what it's trying to block. Other times, you can see what it's willing to allow. So when you're doing the OSCP exam, one of the things you have to do is pivot between three different networks. And the way you figure out what IP addresses to look at is by running the IP tables, because it will explicitly say, you know, allow connections from these IP addresses. That's how you kind of hop around stuff. And then the last local command is netstat dash T-U-N-L-P. What this command does is it says, we're running these programs, and what ports are they bound to, and what are they listening on? And again, this program, you sometimes have to run as a root, so you have to type sudo in front of it. But again, by default, the Kali VM is root, so you're good to go. Uh, what the command is actually showing here, the first column is the, pro is the uh, <laughs> protocol. So we see TCP, TCP6, and UDP. Uh, the local address, which is where it's running on. I'm running as. So you can see the first one here, Postgres, is only listening, is running on a local local host. This uh, DHC client, though, this is running uh, open to the world, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Foreign address, this defines what this service is willing to listen on. Sometimes you can run a service, but only have it listen to yourself. So that's really useful if you're doing a website and you want to say, okay, I want to run MySQL or I want to run Postgres, but I only want to allow connections from the local version of Apache or a local version of Nginx. So that's a really good security thing. You shouldn't put your databases necessarily publicly available, but you should still let them listen locally. So this normally should be 127001, but this is one's a 000. Uh, you can see the state here is listen. So that's actually running. It's actually run, doing something. And then finally down at the end here is the program name. So I was running this service earlier, so I'm going to turn this off. Pseudo service Postgres. Stop. And then if I run netstat tunnel P, you can see that uh, Postgres isn't running anymore. So that's how all that works. Uh, trust me, I have literally spent hours trying to diagnose why a server's not working. But if you just run PSOX, netstat, and IP tables, you can usually figure out what's actually happening under the covers and figure out like why something's not working. So you can check, you know, is the service act is the program running? Do the firewall rules allow it? and is actually listening uh, publicly to the service, for the service. All right. So this page is really useful. This is the uh, Nmap usage page. And this thing is massive. It has like over 120 different command flags to it. I don't know every command flag 
in nmap and frankly you don't really need to know that much you just need to know a few different ones here and there so you can see here some of the command options is things like what type of uh, scan do you want to do do you want to do tcp do you want to do udp do you want to do icmp etc cetera, et cetera. so i'm just going to show you the commands that i found most useful so here it is right here nmap dash vv dash o dash pn dash stuv dash dash top ports 1000 and then for this one for this demonstration we're just going to do localhost so show of hands how many guys have actually used nmap before you guys good awesome cool so i won't talk about nmap too too much uh yeah so there we go this one up. so this one you can see is just going to run a tcp scan udp scan and uh try and probe the service names and versions so this is going to do is okay we're just going to probe ourselves again you can use this against remote services remote hosts so to copy that control shift v run it total is probably take about uh, 90 seconds to scan your cell phone i found when i was doing the oscp uh the first system it was like the first network you have access to i believe has uh 45 or 50 different hosts to it so what i did was you can find it on my github just i have a little script that basically says okay go through all of the IP addresses and do a full port scan. I personally find it easier to do a port scan of the top 1,000 ports, look at what comes up and kind of get like the easy targets. So you find things like Apache, you'll find things like Samba, uh, Postgres, et cetera, et cetera. But then after I do that first pass, then I'll go through and actually do the full 65,000 port sweep. That port sweep takes roughly 15 to 25 minutes per hosts. When I was doing it on the OSCP network, it took me about a day, day and a half to fully do that. So that's definitely one of the first things you want to do. Um, yeah, this is running. Uh, the reason that recon is really important is that you could spend, you, so usually what you do is you're going to port scan your attack, you're going to port scan your target, and then you're going to figure out, okay, which one do I want to attack? Do I want to attack my SQL version, the Nginx version, the website, the Samba, whatever. But it's a lot easier to attack like a side door, attack the developer's network, attack the you know testing, the uh, QA servers. Because you'd be surprised, particularly with people that use uh, Amazon, they tend to include firewall rules that say, well, as long as this server is running within our infrastructure, we'll, we'll trust it. So a lot of times it's a lot easier to attack the kind of like weird side edge services than it is to go through the front door. So if you do really good recon, you can save yourself literally days of time in practice when you're doing pen tests. All right, so you can see here with that one that we just ran here, a lot of information coming back. This is mostly statistics, so if you're really curious about that. Uh, but what really matters here is this entry right here that says port, state, service reason, and version. So you can see before we're running port 68, UDP, is open, is filtered, and is the uh, DHCP service. So that's how that works. Uh, you guys got any questions? Good on that. Uh, do sudo service Postgres SQL start. And then I'll just start Postgres. And then press up twice and scan yourself again. And with the second scan, you should start seeing Postgres pop up in the results. What is Postgres? Uh, Postgres is just a database system. It's uh, oh. basically an open source competitor to uh, Oracle. It's like uh, MySQL. So. Yep. Uh, it's one of the Databases that Metasploit uses. Yep. So. Yeah, so it's used by uh, Metasploit to uh, store all the uh, database resources. Yep. So, in practice, uh, when I was doing the OSCP at least, usually you'll see a ton of websites running on port 80, uh, port 8080, port 8000, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, you'll usually see some kind of database running. Sometimes you'll see a mail server running. Uh, I didn't attack any of those, but there are exploits for mail servers to make them do weird stuff. Uh, you'll also see a lot of uh, Samba file shares, so you can go in there and attack those too. Every now and again, you'll find some like really weird service, like uh, Telnet, just running wild open on the internet. And if you got Telnet running, you just Telnet into it, you can do whatever the hell you want. There's a drone made by Parrot, the latest version of the, um, the drone Parrots, nice. that actually have a Telnet and an FTP server running on them with no username or password and just log in. And just general IP address. And yeah, and they have scripts on there that um, that actually control the, the drone, oh, like a shutdown 
the script. So while it's in mid flight, you just tell that in, you can just That's execute the script. Parrot. Mm -hmm. So I've been working with a couple of those at home and I figured out a way to make it not drop the connection after 60 seconds. Because 60 seconds after boot, it just stops. Uh, and I haven't found a script that actually works on it that does that. Um, it could be a fun yet, job. But a lot later, yeah. Really? I, I have not been able to figure out what is actually kind of uh, might used to be a cron job or like maybe a um, like a power saving feature of some kind. Yeah. I can see that like some kind of like wait timer. Yeah. Talk about it. Maybe try a small bathroom that would turn down your system time off. Sorry, I didn't mean to take that. Oh no, definitely go for it. Um, yeah, so what's funny too is I uh, mess I run OpenWRT at home on my Wi Fi router. And you'd be amazed, most routers uh, do run Telnet. They do allow FTP. And usually they do that more for uh, servicing. So I'm trying to think what the heck it was. It wasn't Jucifer. Ah, it's one of those script kitty guys that did something crazy a couple months ago with the Italian police. Can't remember the guy's name. I think it was Jucifer. Anyways, um, what he did was he said, OK, I know that my target's running these specific versions of this router because he port scanned them, found the version, because just a lot of these services just tell you what they are, and they tell you what version they are. A lot of it was done for compatibility reasons in the past, because you know, 10, 20 years ago, if you were trying to talk to an Apache 5.1 versus a 5.2 server, there's a lot of weird settings that are like really uh, version specific. Because this is before things like um, the W3 organization and even IEEE were really that effective. These organizations only became effective, at least in the public sphere, about, I don't know, what do you think, Tom, like 10 years ago or so? 2005, Yeah, a lot of these companies basically made proprietary interfaces for things. And it was very version dependent. So unfortunately, this is kind of one of the legacies of the internet. Is a lot of services like to tell you what they are and what version they are for compatibility purposes. But that means as a pen tester, you can basically just say, OK, I know what the service is. I know what the version is. Look for an exploit on Google. <laughs> so uh, exploit DB is a really useful resource for that. And uh, the OpenCVE website, you literally just type in the service number and the version, and like you're good to go. And you'll get like a huge list. And it'll be categorized based on um, uh, impact and severity. So that's a really good way of doing pen testing. Uh, you can also tie this information into uh, Metasploit. So do attacks that way. But yeah, I mean, seriously, like look at what your Android phone, your iOS phone, and what your home router is doing. You'd actually be really surprised what ports are open and what services are just sitting there running. And even more scary is if you Google for what the default credentials are. A lot of time, those services are running with default credentials that the manufacturer never reset. Because to actually have a unique password per device cost like a fraction of a penny, and they save money by not doing that. So that's why you have a lot of routers like Cisco routers, et cetera, uh, Juniper routers, Linksys routers, that the default password is just root, root, admin, admin. Most people never change those things. And in practice, you will see them on the internet just open and ready to go. So can I just yep. clarify that this, so the ends, the, what's, it, what's it called? Uh, the end map, yep. the way we did it, we just, looked at all the open ports that the network they were connected to. Exactly. Okay. So with this one right here, uh, what MMAP does is that whatever the last um, numbers are at the end, that's your target. Okay. Yep. So you put in whatever you want. So you need to put in a specific uh, specific IP address, a range of IP addresses, or you can put in a uh, range of host numbers. Okay. So, so there's like four different formats. So if I wanted to do my home router, which most home routers are like not 192.168.1.1, just yep. one, dot one, and there's Try it out. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I'm paranoid at home, so I kind of run this like once a month. I'll just like I'll scan myself, I'll scan the router, I'll scan you know whatever devices are connected, and on my home router at least, I actually have it pinned with uh, MAC address filtering. Uh, so MAC address is basically just a unique security number, like a social security number for your devices, and you can basically tell the router trust this device, trust that blah blah. Granted, you can spoof MAC addresses, but generally it's a good technique. So. Not a layman would do that. Oh, God, no. Most people would never do that. <laughs> Definitely not your neighbor, not your average neighbor. And one thing, uh, since you were asking, I will just point out, if you just give like 192.168.1.1 slash 24 or hyphen, 24 yep. or 256, yep. it's going to scan every device that is connected in your uh, home network. So, oh, yeah. Yep. So okay. you can find out that uh, what possible services are open on your other laptop or your other desktop system that could be infected. So uh, you are expecting that, uh, okay, my desktop 
it's got nothing installed, but unfortunately it does a high port number open, say 49754. That's, that's too high of a port number to be open on our desktop system that has nothing specific, no service running. Then that is definitely sign of an indicator of a compromise. That's a good point too. If you see low port numbers, basically below 1024, those are usually like really important services like HTTP, FTP, mail. If you see ones above 1024 though, those can be kind of weird. Um, a lot of that from what I've seen more on the home, home network is uh, BitTorrent. <laughs> so like BitTorrent, if you're running uh, Skype, we'll have a couple of ports. So my network was running pretty slow last month and I'm just like, what the hell's going on? I saw the traffic and I'm like, okay, there's a lot of weird traffic coming out from all the world. Tracked it, my girlfriend was running, what the heck was it? Uh, it wasn't transmission, it was uh, Deluge. Oh. So I got her running Ubuntu. Oh. And Deluge was running as a bit as a BitTorrent super node. So I'm like, okay, we're gonna shut that whole thing down. So did you fetch your girlfriend? I, I, I taught her about security. I taught her about network networking. So, There's a, I have the, on this, my Arch Linux box, what is yep. it? It's the simplified version of ITT, but I forgot what it's called. I can't remember. IFW. Yeah. IFW, yep. Yeah. And by default, it goes, I think it blocks everything past, like by default, it blocks everything unless specified. Yeah, so that's a good work part too. Most, uh, raising that point too, most systems, most server installations will block low, will block upper ports. Those like in lower ports, it'll, just, it'll block the whole thing. And you have to explicitly tell to open up. Like when I was using the, uh, like the Rackspace servers, yeah. it's all configured that way. It allows port 222 and nothing else, which is super secure. Yeah, but. I think it would be better that way than just enable and then specify which one. To be. Yeah, exactly. Like before design, that, that's what every uh, organization uses. They just block all the ports and open up port they require. That's it. Yep. Right, makes sense. So one of the things people like to do is kind of get a little clever and say, oh, we're not going to run you know, SSH on port 222, or I might say port 222. Uh, 22. 22, 20. port 22, yes. Uh, what they'll do is they'll try and use a higher port. So I, I'm clever, I do that on my website. I run it on 31022. Um, it's not really a deterrent, because if someone does a full port scan, they're going to see it. So. Security, security, security. Yeah, security through obscurity, yeah. So. You know, you can do a lot of these things, but ultimately someone can't scan and can't find it. So, All right, so we've got that with Postgres. Yeah, so if you want to verify that uh, SQL, I want to say Postgres is running. Run a PS aux, and then you can pipe it, just send the, send the output from that to another program. Run grep against Postgres SQL. And boom, there you go. So if you ever need to verify the program actually is running, this is the way you do it. Because you, you would be amazed at how much time and how many back and forth emails I've literally spent days arguing with senior developers saying, oh, well, the database is running. I know it is. I set it up last week. Did you run PSOX grep? No. Could you run that for me, please? Hold on. I'll get back to you. Two days later. Yeah, Postgres wasn't running. I'm like, OK. Solved the problem. Thanks. <laughs> so, again, these things are really simple commands, but you'd be surprised people kind of overlook this stuff. All right, I'm not going to go over how the internet works. I think most of you guys already know that. So, but just really quickly, so your computer talks to the router. In this case, we're all talking to the Wi-Fi router. Then that router talks to a DNS. Uh, the DNS is usually run based on whoever your internet provider is, be it Comcast, Verizon, Time Warner. And what that does is it converts Google.com to the IP address. That's what DNS's function is to convert names into numbers and numbers into names and vice versa. This is fundamentally how the internet operates, is through DNS servers. Then the DNS server, after it converts Google.com into the IP address, that will route it throughout the world. Uh, IP addresses actually do cluster around geographical locations. They're not linear. They tend to be sold in blocks. So in the early internet, when there was like literally a couple thousand people, um, a lot of universities like MIT, Stanford, Harvard, et cetera, they got their own dedicated IP blocks, and some of them were pretty big. So you can't just say 52 is America, 64 is the UK. It's the blocks are non-continuous. Um, but generally, you can kind of figure out geographically where some of the IP addresses actually are in the world. And there are services that do that. Yep, and there's geographical services that do that online. Yep. So that's how that works. So it goes to the server, server's listening on a port, generates a response, sends it back, hits the DNS server. It usually doesn't have to because you kind of tell it what your IP address is for the response on TCP. Then it gives it back, and there you go. The router doesn't have to be the DNS server. You can
That's true. You can't do your own DNS service. Yep. Um, just as long as you have something somewhere that's converting the uh, website name to an IP address. So, so a really useful command is uh, dig. So DNS itself isn't just for websites. It's for any kind of service on the internet. And there's multiple DNS records. I think there's like 128, 160, we think, Tom, like DNS record types. I don't know. There's a bunch of them. But for all intent and purposes, you only need to worry about these five. Uh, C name, this is the uh, canonical name. This says, if you talk to me, you can call me whatever you want. But this is what this is like my primary, this is my main name. So if people ask me what my street name is, I tell them it's El Pollo Asesino. But my real name is Apollo Clark. So they want to speak Spanish. So, uh, so when I was running ApolloClark.com and my wine website, VinoDiscover.com, they're both the same server. But I just have it routing through DNS to the same place. But the canonical name is ApolloClark.com. Uh, next up is A records. So A records are IPv4. Uh, quad A records, that's usually what I call them, is uh, IPv6. So this is what you have things like subdomains. So if you have like, you know, site1.example.com, site2.example.com, you'll usually find A and uh, quad A records for these things. So that right there, if a company is a little bit older or wants to do things in-house, they'll actually tell you what their subdomains are just from these records. So you don't even need to guess. They'll literally tell you dev.example.com, like QA, <laughs> staging, gitlab.example.com. You'll actually find these things on the internet, which is kind of scary. Uh, next up is the MX records. So this is used for things like uh, POP3 and IMAP. This is uh, how you send around email. So this says, yeah, if you send me an email through POP3, this is the IP address that we want you to actually like send it to. Yep. What's that? Right, it's NTP. Yep. Ah, good point. I was incorrect. You do not use POP for MX. Yes. Is that uh, TXT? This is more of like a comment record. Uh, in practice, what this is actually used for is uh, site owner verification. So if you sign up with something like Google Analytics, it wants to have you verify that you actually own the domain. So what it'll have you do is say, okay, here's a, like a unique number. Put that in your TX records so we can verify who you are. Um, you'll sometimes see kind of weird stuff in TX records. You'll see things like people's names, um, comments, so kind of weird stuff in there. Uh, the NS, this is the uh, DNS zone name name server. So this will actually do the resolution for you uh, between the URL and the IP address. And usually they'll have between one and five of them, or a little bit one and four. Uh, or sometimes they'll have many of them, so they can do a little bit better load balancing. Uh, and also you have the SOA, which is the ZNS zone start of authority. And this basically lays out, you know, which of these name servers should you contact and in what order, generally. So we're going to go ahead and run dig-t any wikipedia.org. So dig lets you pull down these records. And by doing dash t any, we're saying give me uh, all of them. So there we go. Uh, the question section is what you're actually sending. Don't really worry about that too much. Yeah, so here you can see the actual commands going through. But all that we really care about is the uh, lower section down here with the responses. So you can see here the A record. So wikipedia.org, this is the A record for that, so the IPv4 address. The quad A record down here for the IPv6. The start of authority, which is the primary name servers, right there. And you can see multiple ones here. You can see name servers 1, 0, and 2. So you can have multiple name server resolutions. And this one here for the MX. Uh, does anyone here know what the uh, first two digits are for the MX records? I think their priority was? It is priority. OK. Um, any ideas why it's not sequential? Why it just goes like 10 to 50? The lower the number, the higher the priority. Oh, uh, OK. Lower the number, higher priority. Typically, you'll see it in increments of five, so it'll be five. Increments of five? OK. Yep, that makes sense. Um, and again, this is more like a load balancing thing, so that way you're not just hammering on one server the whole time. Uh, here with wikipedia.org, you can see what I was talking about with the TXT records, where it says Google site verification. So you can see that. That's how the uh, admins of wikipedia.org prove to Google SEO that they own the domain. This one I'm actually not too sure about. SPF records. What is it? Policy framework. Policy framework? SPF, sender policy framework. Sender policy framework. Spam prevention. Oh, spam prevention. OK, that makes sense. Yep, so um, you can see like the TXT records are kind of like a throw-all. Just they put a lot of stuff in there. 
So that's pretty cool. Uh, any guys have any questions about this? We're good. All right. Cool. All right. Next up is the who is record. And what's kind of funny about Kali, it's not actually installed by default. I was a little surprised by that one. So you have to run sudo apt-get install-y who is. Uh, I'm just using Ubuntu, so it's always there. But when you install the who is, that will let you uh, look up who the registrar is. In other words, who actually registered the domain names. For all that stuff, so you're going to run that. So I already have it installed. So I'll ask you guys in a few minutes uh, when that's going. Uh, but yeah, so as far as joining Whois goes, uh, there's a bunch of stories of hackers and hacker groups getting caught because they didn't hide the Whois information. It sounds, sounds stupid, but people have gotten actually arrested because they didn't do Whois correctly. Uh, when you do Whois, um, what is supposed to, what the intention is, is saying who is the actual domain owner for this. And there's some kind of really loose, rough verification process saying, okay, what's your name? What's your address? What's your phone number? What is your email address? And they'll call you and they'll send you a letter and all that kind of stuff. That happens in America. Uh, it doesn't happen in every country. So there's that. Um, you can actually buy privacy services. So I buy mine through domain.com. And what that happens is domain.com verifies who I am and then they register it on my behalf. So if you do who is against apollclark.com, you won't see my name anywhere. You'll see domain.com. Except for the URL. <laughs> Except for the URL, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> my name's URL. So. All right, so you guys got uh, who is installed? Good to go? No, it doesn't want to install. All right. Oh. What's up? So I'm uh, sorry, going to backtrack a second. So yep. what, why did uh, people get uh, arrested for who is? So They're people. So hackers, hacker groups, and yep. people that have done malicious things online have gotten arrested because of the Whois records. Because when you register a new domain name, you have to verify yourself. Oh, so they didn't register. Yeah. So it can contain the address or phone number. Exactly. Then someone calls them up and say, "Hey, are you a yeah. And they go, "Yeah, that's why you're Yeah, exactly. That's the thing too, because when you look up, you can look up a website. Um, you can do ping, as we saw with ping, will give you the IP address, and you can do the reverse with that too using dig. So. Yeah, it's crazy. Like it's just such a simple thing, but people have gotten messed over by that. Like, it's, yes. yeah. it's good. So I'll do who is Wikipedia.org. So there's really isn't that interesting, but you can see yeah, it's registered to the uh, Wikimedia <coughs> Foundation in California, San Francisco. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, you can see here as I was talking about before the registrant and the admin information. So you have a phone number to call. So if you want to call the Wikipedia guys, that's their phone number. Uh, if you want to email the admin, so there we go, we have dns-admin at wikimedia.org. Yeah. So any of you guys got any fun stories about who is information you found? had their own information. So I could just get the contact number of CEO and had some grievances, just straight away called up them and uh, called up them and asked that this 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 particular employee of yours, uh, he's not cooperating with, them, with me. I am not taking this course anymore, I need my refund. And uh, the process went to the <coughs> Nice. So wait, so the CEO itself yes, had registered the it was, information? Yes, it was a small wow. Company, 15 people company, so that's fine. Nice, that's crazy. They didn't care, so uh, it was pretty handy. Apart from that, I, I use robsx.com plus that quiz. It, it provides more of a graphical view. Oh, nice. What is it? Robtext.com. Robtext. R-O-B-T-E-X. R O B T E X. No, you have E for Rob Bex. Rob Bex. Ah, R O B T E X. Oh, Rob Bex. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Just just type in any domain over here, and it's gonna give you a graphical view of all the MX records, every VNS query, the Google's records, everything. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Select any. How is that legal? <laughs> oh, that's really cool. So what's funny, 
I was going to next show you guys DNS recon, but this is basically the same thing. So uh, the way that these records operate is that they'll show you like the first level view. So I told you about the name servers and the mail servers. Sometimes those, when you talk to those servers directly, they'll have their own like name servers and stuff. And it's like this massive tree structure. So this is a really cool tool. I like this a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at, if, if you have any kind of collection of servers on the internet, they have to communicate to the internet in some way. DNS is the way they do that. And unfortunately, because the way DNS was designed, it is, I would argue, inherently insecure, and it's still inherently insecure, and it allows you to effectively graph out their entire network. Now, I wouldn't say it's every single thing can be networked that way, but you can see here, like you can see a lot of stuff. It's um, not exactly Wikipedia's, but it's the DNS resolvers. Yeah, um, the resolvers. Network. So if they have more than one client under them, every client's, uh, I mean, map would be shown over there, but it's pretty useful. Nice. So it kind of catches my eye, just glancing at this here. I keep seeing EC2, so that's just like a key Amazon. to me. Yeah, they're running Amazon servers, so that's pretty is interesting. That Amazon servers are going? Yeah, EC2 dot whatever, whatever. Yeah, so this is Amazon right there. So you can see, without, I'm not even, we're not even attacking, we're not even scanning these servers, but we can already make assumptions based on what they're doing and running. It's, it's open crazy. Open source intelligence. Exactly, open source intelligence. Passive recon so you don't need any written permission. Okay. Yep. Is this quick step back to you can also throw who has who is at an IP address? Yep. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier how I run two websites, Vino Discover and ApolloClark.com on the same server. Uh, who is and dig allow you to do it both ways. You can say by domain name or IP address. So you can look up resolutions on either one. And so sometimes what you'll see often uh, I'd say moderately commonly, you'll see more than one website or more than one service running on the same server IP address, because it kind of makes sense. You can run more than one version of Apache, so why not host two websites on the same server? So what you'll find sometimes when you're doing pen testing attacks is that you'll say, okay, here is the domain we want you to attack. So you do all this recon on it, and you're like, oh, well, like there's five other websites running on this server. Are they within scope of the attacks? And sometimes the client will say no. Other times they'll say, yeah. So it's like, oh, you know, storefront with, you know, SSL security on the stuff, dot com. Well, we're not going to get into that very easily. Or, you know, SVN, dot example, dot com. I'd rather just go after the code base and just not even mess with the storefront website. So, yeah, again, this will save you a lot of time doing pen testing. It's worth noting if you're blue teaming, uh, a lot of time you just get Comcast or yes. whatever. Yes. That's a good point. When you're blue teaming, you're going to get Comcast. You're going to get whatever the ISP providers are. Yep. What's blue teaming? Uh, yeah, so blue. So in, in uh, security testing, you have red team and blue team. Red team is the attackers, and blue team are the defenders. So I consider myself more blue team because uh, I build systems too. Uh, but if you're running or doing anything like this, it's good to do these kind of like recon, passive attack stuff to yourself, just to see what's out there, to see what other people are seeing. So is this the DNS um, of the local domain? No, this is Wikipedia.org. Well, I mean, the thing is, is how. I High, how high up uh, on the um, the DNS treaty go? So in other words, I'm skeptical. You say you you have a domain name of Comcast.net, and I don't believe you. And I, I want to have an authenticated record. Mm -hmm. So how I I usually go to the root, yep. which is all the way up the tree. Mm -hmm. So is this giving me the root values? I'll turn that one over to Tom. So you have uh, DNS sec. Yeah. Don't, don't turn it over to Tom. Fine. <laughs> He's more of a network <laughs> engineer than I am. My, so. my gut says it doesn't go up that high, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Um, you can Sometimes you can specify your name servers, though. So if you have an address for a root name server on the internet, you could try a request directly against it. And then see what you get back and compare that to the well, DNS. Well, you see, results, I mean, um, you, you can see what the interval of the polling is for the name service and, you know, sculpt the name tree yeah. and, and see what's going on. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know for sure. Yeah, so basically, DNS, again, as you can see with this website, is a huge tree structure. Um, you can start on one really small subdomain and kind of work your way back up. Can you get, uh, can you get some zoom action on that? It's kind of hard to see. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, come on, there. Yeah, so this is what kind of caught my eye, too, was the whole EC2 dash, whatever. And you can see us-west.one, compute.amazon.us.com. 
So that clearly just tells me like they're on Amazon doing something. This, site is this is uh, wikipedia.org, which is just one of their subdomains. <laughs> Robtex.com. What is the NSA NS ETR? Yep, so these NS records, these are what I was talking about earlier with the uh, different oh, domain records and things like that. So, yeah. why am I getting gaywargame.com instead of Wikipedia? Never mind, I'm just looking at these. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, check your local Etsy host. Alrighty. Uh, that's a joke. Um, Anyways, uh, but yeah, you can kind of see just how we're not even attacking servers. We, like, we can get you know half of what they're running, how it's interconnected, and like what's what's going on there. All right. Uh, really good command to run to is trace route, and this will show how your traffic is actually going around the internet. And this is one of those tools I use too a lot when I'm trying to diagnose uh, network problems. So there could be times where you your laptop says you're connected, you can't ping out. So you're gonna try and figure out like what's broken in your system. So with this one, trace route will show you where your uh, package is kind of popping around the internet. Uh, the star star just means it's either waiting or whatever server connected to is just not responding. So it's giving me issues right now. It usually works fine on my home network, but sometimes you go on public networks, trace route gets blocked or isn't allowed to run. Oh, we're on guest Wi-Fi. Yeah, so trace route won't always work for you, unfortunately. But uh, if you can run it, you can find some interesting things. A uh, tool that I really like, I'm trying to use more lately, is DNS Recon. So you saw from robtext.org how you can uh, enumerate and go through all these things. And you can't do it by hand, but just teach me in the ass. So use, uh, use DNS Recon. Yeah, it doesn't really have much of a uh, tutorial there, which kind of sucks. But. So we tag man space DNS recon. Oh, seriously? Oh, yeah, DNS recon. DNS recon. They're trying to map our DNS. Like yeah, exactly. Like uh, but yeah, so if you ever want to know what a tool's doing, check out the man pages. Just man space command name. So we can do help, domain, blah, 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 range. So what's really cool about this is the tool that I like the most is trying to enumerate all the subdomains. So site1.example.com, site2.example.com, qa.dev.example.com. Uh, it's really hard to, or it takes, it's a really tedious process to enumerate all those. If you're lucky, you'll get the A records and the quad A records, but not always. Sometimes what to do is just a star. So all of your requests will go to this one server. Usually it's Nginx or some kind of like reverse proxy, and then it will split that over to whatever server you actually intend to talk to. So the problem with that is you may not actually know what all the IP addresses and what all the DNS servers are that are on that domain. So the way you can do that is you can kind of brute force it. Uh, you could do a lazy brute force where you just say A, B, C, D, blah, blah, blah. You can do all that. Uh, I find it's a lot more useful to give it a dictionary attack. So you can do things like QA, test, dev, uh, staging, admin, um, I'm trying to think what else, like contact us, et cetera, et cetera, dot com. And you can usually find something pretty interesting. Other ones I like to look for are things like GitLab um, or other names of like open source or closed sourced uh, source repositories. Because literally sometimes you'll find the source repositories with just the code and like, you're good. <laughs> uh, other times, which is more interesting, I've seen this just personally doing web development. Um, you'll find subdomains where the developers have named them after uh, seasons of the year. So you find things like spring one, spring 2016. Uh, summer 2015, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, other times you'll find them using acronyms of some kinds, like Twitter might be like TWT. So the name's like, you know, Comcast, Try, CM, CT, you know, little, little abbreviations. Uh, other times, you know, if I find this eh, occasionally, a little bit rare, but occasionally, uh, where they'll use the old name of a company. So I can't remember what Uber was called. Uber was called something else. Or no, um, uh, what's that sharing site we buy the coupons? Groupon. So Groupon had some other name, I can't remember what it was called though, like the Lookout or something like that. So you might find a service called like lookout.example.com. And these are usually like old testing servers and like dev servers and stuff. Uh, other times you can find things like uh, file share hosts, uh, mail servers, <laughs> like crazy stuff like that. 
Yeah, so you can see here it lets you uh, enumerate the various types of records, pass in a list. Yeah, so this right here is zone walk. That's what the uh, Rob text service was doing. It was basically just walking through all of those records and constantly querying. So it's like, okay, you know, I found this list of servers, talk to those servers directly and see what they have for records, talk to those and blah, 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 you kind of go all the way down the tree. So that's what a zone walk does. Yeah, so I wrote this tool back in late 2006. It was my favorite tool for enumerating through DNS. In great part because I wrote it, it gives me output in a way that I can manipulate my own style. Uh, one of the features that I needed the most and gave me excellent results is the SRV record enumeration. So, yeah, so you can do things like Kerberos, uh, LDAP, FTP enumeration, NTTP enumeration, Telnet, who is. So it basically takes all the um, tedium out of trying to uh, do zone walking. So I was tempted to have you guys run this, but I decided I didn't want to get Pivotal banned from the internet. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> but just know DNS record, DNS recon works, works really, really well. Now, on the downside to this, uh, port scanning is a really effective technique, but it can get you caught. I have gotten a few emails from Amazon, and they don't like me port scanning. <laughs> So uh, port scanning is really, really useful. And we do the OSCP, uh, you, you do need to port scan. And they don't have firewalls for that. I think um, it was you. Uh, well, it's because it was from one of my servers. So it was when I was at one of the uh, IoT security events. And they actually said, you know, please port scan our servers. Like, go ahead, attack them. I think they were staging servers. So they're like, oh, yeah, go ahead and attack us. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, be, I'm gonna be clever. I'm not going to use the local network, because everyone else isn't using it. I'm going to go on my Amazon account and run Cali on Amazon and scan it. And then the next day I got an email from Amazon. They're like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so Yeah, Amazon's pretty picky about scanning from or or at their network. You need yep. to like have a form that says I'm a, I'm good to do the security testing. Exactly. So don't scan from Amazon. Azure. Yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> Azure exists. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Port scanning, as far as firewall rules go, most firewalls can detect a port scan. Like, to be able to have have your server and have a server that says, well, I'm running port 80, I'm running port 22, I'm running port, you know, 53, whatever. And you're asking to talk to me on port 11111. Okay, that's kind of weird. Whatever. Port 22222. Okay, it's a little suspicious. Port 5555. Okay, clearly you're doing something weird. So it's pretty easy to actually detect uh, port scan attacks. Um, the hard part, though, is if a service, if a firewall is configured to say, after you unsuccessfully port scan five times, we just block you. Like that's a really good firewall. But. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just gonna suggest that if you're laying out a pen test and you're concerned about getting picked up, and map has varying degrees of scans and you should start with something more passive. Yeah, do passive so scans first. you can document first. what you can find and then increase the aggressiveness as you go. Um, so you can have some degree of response before you get shut off. That's a good point. So with Nmap, um, okay. there's other stories I've heard from other pen testers where they're running Nmap even on a local network, and they've literally crashed the network, like from one computer. That's it. So Nmap is can be a very aggressive uh, service because you think about it. If you're scanning the entire network, every single computer is going to reply back to you, and one computer may only give you one or two kilobytes, but if you have a thousand machines and they're all giving you back like 20 kilobytes really, really quickly, that's a ton of data. You literally can't overload switches. So keep that in mind. Like, um, If you're at home, <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, I haven't crashed my local network, but it probably could. So like Tom said too, like be gentle when you're starting up with Nmap. You know, usually I'll scan the first 100 ports, top 100 ports, do the first 100, then do 1,000, and then I'll do like the whole kitchen sink. Because uh, that's one of the things too, when you are doing pen tests, is you don't want to burn an IP address. That kind of sucks. So what a lot of pen testers will do, and hackers do this all the damn time, is you'll get like a really cheap VPN service, and you'll say, okay, cool, give me like you know 20, 50 IPs, and they're pretty cheap too. They're only like four or five bucks. I mean, for a decent one, for a cheap one, it's like a dollar, you know, uh, fifty cents per IP address. So what you'll see in practice when your servers are getting hacked or scanned is they'll be coming from like a hundred IP addresses. Now, the problem with that is that gets around those firewall rules I just mentioned. If you scan five ports that aren't running, we're going to block you. Well, that's per IP address. 
So if you distribute those scans over 100 or 1,000 IP addresses, the firewalls are kind of like, well, you didn't quite hit the limit, so we're just going to keep letting you go. So that's one of the big attacks you'll see in live production services, uh, slow and low. You know, they'll scan you for like weeks, months. Like this stuff isn't just hard, heavy, and fast. It's very, very slow, very kind of quiet. And if you're running a production server that has 100,000 users, honestly, you're probably not going to even notice that in the log files unless you really know what to look for. So I guarantee, I know this for a fact, because I know people that do this, like SOB. Um, they, people are literally scanning the entire internet all the time. So the minute you put a server online, it is getting scanned within probably about three days. Uh, this, you'll see scans from Russia, China, Eastern Europe, uh, very rarely America, very rarely Canada, uh, South America, Africa, uh, Iraq. I've seen ones from like uh, was it Myanmar, things like that. Uh, there's scans coming from everywhere. You are a target. You are being scanned. This is a fact. Uh, one of my favorite songs, Dual Core. He says, the minute you put a server on the internet, someone's going to own it. So good to know. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so that's basically how servers operate, how DNS operates, how it interworks and connects to each other. Uh, I showed you guys how to do local port scanning. What I found really useful when I was doing the OSCP is a lot of times you'll be attacking websites, web services. And those will be using things like PHP, Python, Perl, we run Rails, Java, whatever, whatever. What's interesting about that is pretty much all these programming languages include some kind of command line interface. So what's cool about it is if you can do remote command injection, which actually isn't that hard uh, once you start doing it, you can basically have PHP say, run netstat, run if config, like give me some information about what you're doing, like what's actually going on in that server. You can totally do that. And it's a really effective technique. And then sometimes you can actually, if you have the right permissions for PHP or Java, you can actually start manipulating it and start saying like, yeah, turn off IP tables. Go ahead and open up uh, IP, can, go ahead and, and uh, edit Postgres to listen to every connection from every IP address and restart the service. You can totally do that. That totally happens. Reverse net card on the port. What's up? Reverse net card on the particular port. Yeah, so there's also, too, I didn't really talk about it here, you don't get too much in it, but yeah, Netcat is a really useful service for doing forward and reverse connections. So if you just want to get like a really quick, simple shell without having to install SSH or PowerShell or any of that crap, just use Netcat. Netcat is like dirty, old, but it works. It's like the uh, Swiss Army knife of yes. networking. It's a Swiss Army knife of networking. Literally, you can poke holes in anything. Exactly, yeah. Netcat can run on any, any port. So Netcat is like the backdoor, backdoor, backdoor. just works everywhere. It's awesome. Uh, so that's all of that. Uh, final, I'm not going to really show it to you guys, but you guys should like, definitely look into it. Uh, Burp Suite. Uh, this works great if you're attacking websites. This allows you to monitor your HTTP request and traffic, so that way you can uh, monitor it, replay it, um, do pen test attacks against websites. So that's a really good tool. Uh, it's a tool that you'll see a lot of pen testers talk about, and a lot of them do use it, but it's not the best tool. Um, in practice, if you're trying to do really aggressive pen testing, like you know doing a scan or brute forcing uh, URLs, then uh, it's a Java program. It crashes. So. First suite, really, really cool, but don't try to overload it. Uh, next up is man in the middle proxy. This is a command line uh, HTTP proxy, so it's like Burp Suite, but it's command line only. This is really, really good for doing SSL stripping. So if you see someone using HTTPS, just run man in the middle proxy. It'll totally like destroy that, and you can uh, pivot through that and like break it. Yep. Um, recently, or uh, like from last couple of years, Google Chrome and Mozilla and even now the Spartan and the Edge browser, they force you to use SSL even if you use SSL strip. Yeah, so. So it's, it's, no, it's extremely rare cases that you'll find it to be successful. It can be successful if you pivot around the network, you gain an access. Once you're inside, then, of course, SSL strip, it's a heaven. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's a good point, too. A lot of the browsers now are picking up on this. SSL stripping still works. I've tried that on several banking websites. It works very well. <laughs> but yeah. Can I get the link? So SSL strip. Oh, you take the link. Uh, Those just being strange. strange. <laughs> SSL stripping before. Really? Yeah. But doesn't Google uh, force you to? Well, it forces you if the website tells you uh, there is a HTTP flag to that. But if not, uh, because the Google doesn't necessarily, Chrome doesn't necessarily know whether the site is yes. Google or not. 
Switzerland to be using his HTTPS or you have to be reliant on the person to click up, proceed anyway. Yep. So that's the thing too. So if there are people online, the recording. Um, a lot of browsers now will check SSL stripping and they'll actually verify the certificates and they'll say, oh, well, this is clearly is not registered to this domain, blah, blah, blah. Uh, however, a lot of apps, Android apps and even desktop applications, oh, they don't check at all. They don't even care. So you can do self-signed search and just completely destroy HTTPS. HTTPS looks nice. It is useful. It is definitely a great thing to have, but it's not going to protect you. As soon as a developer says, oh, wait, I have to deal with self-signed cert in my dev environment, screw that. Yeah, exactly. People, developers don't like self-signed certs. Yeah. Uh, there's another tool that does that. Um, it's another type of Swiss Army knife kind of tool called BetterCap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So BetterCap and BetterCap. Yeah, it's like next generation of EtherCap, um, although it's a lot more extensible. And um, yeah, it's a neat little Ruby app, although, I don't know. It's kind of a pain in the ass to, well, I've had a lot of trouble setting it up, but when you get it to work it's, it, it, it runs, it's a really cool tool, really fun. Nice. Yeah, so BetterCap, there's a EtherCap, Ethereal, I think, but um, yeah, no, like if you really want to start, um, well, all these techniques I showed to you are fairly passive, but if you want to start being more, a little more aggressive and really start kind of pivoting around and seeing what's there, uh, definitely record your traffic, which involves having a proxy. Uh, the proxy could be an HTTP proxy, which is more useful for websites and web services, or, or it could be just a general network proxy. So these are good services for that. Uh, the other one I use all the time is uh, obviously Wireshark. Wireshark will just monitor everything. Uh, there's kind of a joke in IT and security, uh, PCAPs or didn't happen. So, <laughs> but I would argue you can pick PCAPs. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, I'd like to add one more. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Talking the evening, Recon NG. I, I yeah, Recon NG is a good one. I haven't used that one yet, but yeah, it's, so it's awesome. It's OS 10 tool and helps you just map out the entire infrastructure, whatever you were saying about the QA, staging, every kind of domain. So I just ran like five minutes ago about Airbnb.com and I have about 100 domains on their IP addresses. Right? Exactly, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, if you run against Airbnb. And it's open source intelligence, so they can't touch me, right? Exactly. Uh, also, this is running off of somebody else's. Recon NG, that's a web app you can go it's to? It's inside, and just try Recon NG. Yeah, so Recon NG is a local, uh, uh, it's, it's, a web, it's, it's a service, and it's real local, you can run it and everything, so. Uh, Similar to Metasploit, you just NG. load modules and you run, that's it. Yeah, Recon NG. Does Recon NG do, like, people in? As well. That one, I don't know. I haven't really used that one too yes. much. But. I got okay. contact numbers. I got uh, names as well. That's, nice. one most, that's one of the most useful things you can do once you are in somewhere is you can figure out who you it's, want it's, to it's, uh, Mostly you'll get the contact details of the person who is registered in the Google's database. But yep. if someone's mad enough to leave his contact details, then you can get it. Apart from that, uh, there's one more, FOCA. Foca, I haven't heard yeah, that one. F-O-C-A. So it works C -A. on the archive files. Uh, no. Yeah, I guess it's like Yeah, so Cali itself has like 35 different DNS tools in it. Yeah, no. So that's off one. This one? Yep. Yeah. Foca. Okay. Since development has stopped, uh, there's a very good uh, black, no, Defcon talk on FOCA as well. Uh -huh, and Defcon talk on FOCA. It's like it works or gives you an environment for uh, searching all the archive files. So if any organization has uploaded any PDF, any blogs online, so you can see Portuguese, the metadata. Uh, Spanish. It's, it's Spanish, Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Spanish. Okay. Cool. So from metadata, a lot of times you can get the contact details and the other information. Nice. So it will give you all the Excel files, all the PDF files of any organization. Just download them, check their metadata, get the contact details of the person, try a social engineering attack. Oh, that's a good point too. You just raised up. Um, sometimes you'll find uh, file stores online, like FTP, just open to the internet. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. If you if you really just want to. I wouldn't call the internet a garbage fire, but 
if you Google around a little bit long enough and you kind of put in the right FTP URLs for things, you'll find it. You're like, you'll find them just posting uh, publicly available file shares. And that's a lot of just, you know, saying, okay, the sales team wants to share files and they want to do it from wherever they are, a home, remote, blah, blah, blah. Let's give them a file share. So they give them FTP and the FTP is in lockdown and it works and bad things happen. So. Oh, well, on that note, two other tools. Um, there's one called a uh, Git Rob. Git Rob. That's a yeah. good one too. Yeah, yeah. Will, Will was telling me about that one a while back. So that could definitely save you a lot of uh, time if you're trying to attack somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Git Rob goes through the GitHub repos and just like destroys it and finds everything. Yeah. We'll take your, it will target an organization for public repo and then map all of the contributors repos. Oh, that's cool. So that the contributors too. The contributor commits something insecure in a separate repo that's possibly tied to their corporate stuff. So yeah, so that's raising a really good point too. Uh, contributors putting in multiple repos, you will see this all the time, is people have like their secret little password. Yeah, uh, mine is uh, Rick Rolling, but all in, all in lead speak. Uh, but we're human beings, unfortunately, and we will reuse password credentials all the time. We will reuse usernames, credentials, uh, configuration settings. API keys. API keys, oh god, yeah. Uh, so what GitRob does, it goes through and scrapes all that, uh, finds things like AWS keys, SSH keys, passwords, usernames. It's just, you know. And uh, Pastebin Scraper. Oh, I haven't used that one. Yeah, that one just goes through, you know. Pastebin Scraper. Yeah, it just goes through, like, Pastebin uh, type sites, just looking for what could be a potential, you know, login you know, user credentials. Pastebin Sparker. Pastebin, there we go. Is it targeted? Can you just scope it down to like an organization there? Um, the I think it just goes through the entire thing. I, I haven't really used it a whole lot, um, but still, it's a pretty neat little little tool. Yeah. So you can see too, like we're not even attacking a server. We're not running these crazy leak zero days and buffer overflow attacks and kernel overflows. We're just looking at what's on the internet. And you can find so much crap. It's insane. Oh, and. Uh, Shodan HQ. Uh, Shodan, yeah. yeah. Shodan. Shodan, Shodan great. I am the most open port in the world. Okay, so there's still like Windows 3.1 machines out there. That I have strong opinions about Shodan. Windows, yeah. I think Shodan's cool. Again, it's one of those like literally scraping the entire internet and seeing what's out there. That's like the Google of machines that are. Yeah, it's basically, it's basically the Google of uh, things. I mean, you'll find stuff like crazy. I, I, I saw it at DEF CON last year. You'll find things like uh, nuclear controllers, uh, yeah. dam controllers, you know, people's baby monitors and stuff. And a lot of that, because I, I make websites too, and I make servers, a lot of it isn't that people are stupid and lazy idiots. It's that a lot of people in IT are incentivized to make a system run. So it says, okay, can I install a baby monitor, go to my workplace, pull up a URL and see my baby. Yes, we can. All right, cool, we're done. Management's happy, you know, sales is happy, marketing's happy. You got a product, it's out there, cool. It's like developers versus deadline. You know? Developers versus deadline, yeah, it's a good, yeah. Um, what, was paste, what was the website for Pastebin? Uh, Pastebin Scraper, that was on GitHub. Oh, yeah, that's why. Yep. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately that's the way a lot of IT is built and designed. And security is usually an afterthought. And unfortunately, for now at least, in our current times, the website is 2016, there's really no certification for how secure a product is. There's nothing that says, you know, this product is X secure, it has been port scanned, it has been checked for authentication issues, you know, certificate pinning, and all these security problems. Very few companies ever actually do that. I mean, the only ones I can really think of would be things like Blackphone, you know, did that. A handful of IoT devices do it, but then again, most people don't. So what ends up happening is you have all these things on the internet that are just kind of sitting there. And a lot of project managers, I've heard this firsthand, you know, we're not a target. Don't worry about it. We're good. No one knows about us. No one even knows about the, No one knows this site exists. We don't have anything anybody would want. We don't have anything anyone's going to want. It's like, no, the second you put that online, it's going to have an IP address, it's going to get scanned. Someone's going to find it. Someone's going to do something to it. We'll add it to a botnet. Oh, exactly, yeah. It'll be a botnet. Yep. So you're a couple more. more. Once it's compromised, and it could be aware also of the exploits. Yeah. So I'm going to cut off the live stream. <laughs> So we can tell the good stories.